so welcome everyone to our executive series. We have got one of our members here, Todd Palmer, who is kicking it off by talking about AI, specifically the six questions executives should be asking themselves when they're pondering an AI strategy. And I'm particularly excited about this because AI is this term you hear kicked around all the time these days, right? And so all executives were like, yeah, yeah, we know what AI is when we really don't. <laughs> and if we do know what it is, we probably aren't thinking proactively about how it's going to impact our business or how we might make decisions around whether or not it should even be utilized in our business. And so Todd was kind enough to present today to talk us through that. A couple of housekeeping things. We want to let Todd go through this entire process. So let's make sure we've all put our microphones on mute. There is a chat feature. You can post your questions in there and we'll save the questions till the end because I'm sure your question may or may not get answered as he's continuing through the presentation, uh, but there'll be plenty of time for questions at the end, okay? All right, so with that in mind, Todd, welcome and take it away. Hey, thanks, JT. So, um, so a problem. Uh, rural farmers in Kenya have diseased crops and Penn State is working on training um, artificial intelligence on pictures of healthy and unhealthy plants so that farmers can use an app on their phone to take pictures of their crop and to determine what to do. Another problem, uh, bottega owners in Kenya pay a high price for fruits and vegetables. This is primarily because of rot and just the way that the supply chain is working. Uh, companies like Twiga um, out of Nairobi are formalizing their supply chain, capturing the data from that formal supply chain and predicting what the harvest supply is and then what the consumer demand for those supplies are. And the, the downstream effects of that is bringing prices down, stabilizing the supply chain and ultimately reducing rot and, and making customers happy. So as, we, as I talk through this presentation, one thing I want to have you keep in the back of your mind is that AI is just a tool. It's a tool to accomplish an objective. It's just like Six Sigma. It's like Microsoft Office or Agile Project Management, just a tool and an application. So AI, ML, What's the difference? I've got a little video here. I'm gonna let you listen to. It's about four minutes. <laughs> machine learning, AI, AI, machine learning, artificial intelligence, machine learning, machine learning, or AI, machine learning, machine learning, AI. Confusing, right? Artificial intelligence and machine learning are often used interchangeably. So they must relate to each other. But how? AI or artificial intelligence can train machines to perform human tasks. The term was invented in the 1950s when scientists began exploring how computers solve problems on their own. Most of the time, when you hear AI, you probably see these ridiculous images. I grew up at a time where we were watching the Jetsons and uh, 2001 A Space Odyssey, where they had Hal the talking computer. So for me, artificial intelligence is really like a computer or machines that are given uh, properties, human-like properties. We take for granted how our brains effortlessly calculate the world around us every second, every day. AI is the kind of the computer can do the same. All of our speech interfaces for our devices are AI. And it's incredible. You can have an accent. You can be speaking a particular dialect that as long as there's data on the internet with that language, these AI systems can quickly develop a way of interacting. I can pick up my phone and I can ask it questions. Like I can say, Siri, say my name. You're Tom. That's your friend. Call you and Lars Smiley. Well, AI is a broad span of human ancient abilities. Machine learning is a subset of AI. Train the machine how to learn. Machine learning models look for patterns in data and try to draw conclusions, like you or I would. They're not being explicitly programmed by people. You can actually give them examples, and they're going to learn what to do from those examples. A huge difference is it's much easier for us humans to give examples than it is for us to write code. Once the algorithm gets really good at drawing the right 
decisions, it applies that knowledge to new sets of data. That's the life cycle. It's ask the question, collect the data, train the algorithm, try it out, collect the feedback, use the feedback to make the algorithm better. So you have increasing accuracy and performance. Ta-da. Google car, it has lasers on the top, which are telling it where it is in terms of the surrounding area. It has radar in the front, which is informing the car of the speed and motion of all the cars around it. And it uses all of that data to figure out not only how to drive a car, but also to figure out and predict what potential drivers around the car are going to do. And that's almost a gigabyte a second of data that that car is processing. One of the things that they're working on is, for example, the scanning of tumors. Can you just imagine one day where they could actually do a scan and determine whether a tumor is benign or not, instead of having to go in and take a sample every time they're trying to figure out what's going on inside your body? It's very Star Trek, right? And if you look at the number of continuous streaming information from IoT, uh, from uh, the beacons and sensors, it gives us the ability to understand our environment much more intimately than we ever could before. That's what AI and ML need. They need granular data, they need very large volumes of data, and they need extremely diverse data sources to be able to find the patterns and learn. So we're going to have a chat box that tell us in the morning, well, tell me the latest news. <laughs> Okay, so it can read the stock market, it can read all, all of the, the financial numbers that you need to actually or just tell you the number, tell you the story. There you have it. AI is a science, computers are really humans. Machine learning is the method behind how machines learn from data. There are so many problems to solve. Find the one algorithm to take care of you. So it's interesting. Did anybody spot the opportunity for Siri to get additional uh, machine learning training? Uh, it doesn't really understand the MR in uh, MR Smiley. Uh, is really Mr. Smiley. Uh, so again, uh, there are limitations to, to AI ML. Um, but to recap uh, what, what the SAS presentation was, um, AI and, and ML are a set of tools that uh, leverage some key software development concepts, such as Agile, SDLC, software development lifecycle, and require a relatively mature data set, uh, data mindset. Um, so you've heard a lot of the cool products that uh, are on the horizon and are actively uh, being engaged today. Uh, companies are on the bandwagon with, with AI and machine learning, but product development isn't the driver. Again, machine learning, artificial intelligence, they're just, they're just a tool for product development. Awesome. Todd, can you lean in a bit? We're starting to lose your sound a bit. Awesome. Yeah. Yep. So why are leaders so keen on, on machine learning and AI? Well, it's profit potential. You know, there's a current, um, Accenture has forecasted major net profit lift for companies in industries that adopt AI. The current revolution is in financial services where data is heavily available. Um, and, but you'll see uh, other industries where intensive workflow processing, and, like construction or healthcare, where AI and machine learning will have the most benefit and therefore the greatest potential for, for profit. Right now you're seeing that there's not as much profit um, uh, uh, potential uh, in financial services because they've been doing this for quite some time. Mm -hmm. I've been doing uh, a version of machine learning since 1996. So um, companies are, IDing, are, are identifying where to insert um, machine learning and 
um, artificial intelligence into their strategies. Um, and one of the things that they're looking at is, is um, their main, uh, you know, what is their main competitive advantage? You know, are there areas within their company, within their processes that they can, they can use machine learning to, to optimize? So things such as optimizing their, their, their P&L, their revenue cost. Is there something in their line item P&L that they can extract costs, automate, um, augment uh, workflows to, to improve, to improve the, the, cost, the cost model? Um, others are looking at it as, as erecting barriers. Um, new entrants are coming into their market, and if they have automation and they have and and they have the data available, they will take and 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 create that that barrier. Or they've got competitors who who are actually offering AI today and using it, and, and so they need to stay stay in the game uh, so that, that they can have a sustainable competitive advantage. Um, and then. Um, it, it's not just being applied to just one strategy. So you will see um, leaders that are taking and, and looking across all of these different strategies to see where AI can be applied. So when you think of it about the companies that are currently doing AI, um, IBM, Airbus, FedEx, Chase, Amazon, Delta, Freddie Mac, Apple, Google. You, you, the, the list goes on and on. From the big players to, to much smaller, more agile players. One of the key components that, to that is how much data do they have and, and the quality of the data and the frequency of the data. So, um, so some industries are, are better geared at bringing AI ML online, typically data rich. And, and this is what, and these industries and these players are what's called um, being digitally intense, you know. And I, can, I consider um, this comparison of, of um, digital intensity. Um, my mother's use of her cell phone to my, where she's using it for her telephone versus me using uh, my mobile phone for text, Google, and, uh, like Google Maps, versus my 13-year-old nephew who uses it for, uh, to sustain his social life. So digital intensity is, is leveraging data driven opportunities to to improve things within your operations or improve your products so that you can increase your revenue and, and grow your market share. So um, early tech um, data adopters have the first mover advantage. Um, you'll see industries such as telecom and financial services um, these are groups that already have the infrastructure in place. When I was working at, at, at Freddie Mac many years ago, 1996, the company went through and said, hey, we are going to build a data warehouse that is going to house a, a lot of our data. And I was able to take and, and, and utilize that data to build predictive models for foreclosure and credit rating. Um, on, on millions and millions and millions of transactions that, that the company was, was, was getting in the door um, from, from mortgage, mortgage finance. Um, so uh, these companies have robust data stores. They're, they have the analytics already built in, uh, the workflows, and they have, they have key talent. They've already hired people who understand what data and data analytics is. And of course, they've got, they've got the technology. So um, one of the questions then is, okay, if I'm at this level, and, or if, if there are all these companies that are already first mover advantage, you know, where am I in the spectrum? 
you know, I have to do some assessment here. So you really need to take and look at, and do some self-assessing of your organizational and digital strengths and weaknesses. Doing that SWOT analysis, looking at yourself and saying, hey, where am I at in the spectrum of being digitally ready? And not only digitally ready, but process-oriented ready. You know, there are processes within a company that that are workflows that workflows feed in such as hey i've got a call center and there's data that's that's happening within the call center but i also have data coming in from hr i'm coming i've got data coming in from finance all of these different areas that um you need to be aware of um and and so assessing that that information uh, with your your organization is is probably one of the first and early steps that leaders are taking in in, in their AI um, and uh, machine learning journey. So, how are leaders rethinking their corporate strategy around AI and, and machine learning? Um, I got. Uh, um, I pulled some data from, from McKinsey, and McKinsey did a survey, um, and they have this amazing podcast, and I'll, I'll throw this out to folks, but um, only 8% of a thousand companies that they've surveyed um, has successfully scaled their, their AI and ML operations. And I pulled three uh, antidotes out of, of, of that material uh, to illustrate some of the, um, the components of it. Uh, first of all, the eight percenters are saying that they spend as much on training and adoption as they do the actual technology themselves. So that means everybody in the organization has to understand what data is, what data analytics is, and be able to contribute and share the knowledge um, around their work processes and in building the data infrastructure that's required uh, to, to build these models. The second thing is, is that um, companies um, that have failed in this, the other 92 or X amount, and, and those that haven't even thought about it, um, but the companies that have failed state the major cause is a lack of data analytics maturity within the work stream process. Again, this is things where you would have anticipated um, uh, uh, data being captured at a certain, certain area uh, in the workflow, and it hadn't. I'll use this example. I was working with a servicer client um, a couple years ago um, in mortgage servicing, and they had a process from which to work with customers um, to, um, when the customer called up, they would say, hey, I need to get a, a um, coupon book. And, and so the, the person would put in the computer, hey, my customer needs to get a coupon book. Well, the, the computer would send out a request that would land on somebody's desk and it would be a manual process. Well, that person would, would take that request and then manually send out an email to to the the company the vendor and say hey we need a coupon book for so and so to be sent to so and so and then they they went on to the next person what they didn't do was capture anywhere that that data point that hey i sent this this email to the vendor and this is the this is this is what happened um and it got recorded so we never knew whether or not the customer actually got the, the, the coupon book or even when that person put that transaction in. So not having that data was a big, was a big problem for, for getting um, automation put in place and getting the data analytics around to say, hey, is there something that we can do to speed up the process? It took many different people to, to um, uh, in the process to actually um, understand what was needed in order to create um, the, the functions for automation. And then the other item was 
targeted. Uh, so developing developing these process uh, machine learning and agile um, uh, artificial intelligence, it takes um, it takes uh, a combination of um, subject matter expertise and um, process expertise. And what these the companies that were failing were finding is that targeted agile is impossible. So if you take machine learning and say to your product developer folks or your software development folks, hey, we've got this little project over here for machine learning. Would you do this uh, on, on, and, and get it out the door? It doesn't work because of all these connectivities in, in workflow, this has to be an end-to-end -end training mindset and tech solution. So what do, what do we do? What, what's, what is the strategic and tactical um, development um, uh, objectives here? How am I going to deliver this thing? You know, what skills are, the, are my people going to need to have? How do I fit this into the culture um, of the company and, and, and move people into a, a digital culture mindset? Well, the first thing that you're going to do is, is you're going to get alignment on the corporate AI ML strategy and vision. This is senior executives who are looking at the industry, looking at your strategy, your corporate strategy across those different areas that I spoke about earlier and going, hey, I have product development. I want a, a segment over here on customer experience. I want a segment over here on, on P&L optimization. And oh, I've got um, a vendor who is starting to, to include AI in their products to us. And so therefore, I want to take advantage of what they have to offer. So getting that alignment in the a vision from everybody in, in the, the organization is, is, is one key component. Another is selecting a few focus areas for the technology. So if I'm going to go through the P&L optimization, I need to take and say, hey, what are some areas within the P&L that I might look to um, apply um, AI to? It might be some of these workflow processes, making it more, more efficient. Human augmentation, you know, one of the biggest things is that people are afraid that they're gonna lose their job to automation, that they're gonna lose their job to machine learning and robotics. But that's really may not be the case. We still need human beings, but we do have some processes that can be much more efficient if we have these the, this AI machine learning to assist to assist people, so making it a safe safe environment for them, and and, and so having this focus area and selecting selecting a few of those focus areas will will help um, push push um, AI and um, machine learning um, into into the business, and then uh, probably the 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 50 50 um model here that the eight percent said was made them successful was promoting a company-wide cultural shift to to a digital mindset everyone from the admin pool and the people who are working on the shop floor all the way up to senior executives and the ceo need to be trained about what AI is, what machine learning is, how the data scientists actually create the models and, and what the, they're gonna do with coming in and, and asking you, hey, how do you do your how do you do your job? And what data points do you do you capture or don't capture so that we can we can build start building predictive models. So it takes an organizational development component in that digital mindset. Um, it, yes, training is, 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 is part of it. Rewarding sharing, sharing of data, sharing of experiences. How do I do my work? And then 
um, making sure that um, there is cross-functional collaboration. Ownership happens at the business leader level. So these models are not owned by IT. They're not owned by the chief data scientist. They're owned by the business owners. They're maintained by the business owners and enhanced by the business owners. They are the sponsors. Yes, tech takes tech people and, and IT uh, software development lifecycle habits, but the business owns it. And so they need to collaborate cross-functional between IT, uh, uh, the CFO area, and, and any of the other groups that touch, touch their business. They need to, to integrate and have conversations. Then the other thing is, and this is more of a tactical perspective. So I'm a product developer by, by, by trade. And so when I think about um, executing machine learning and, and artificial intelligence into a, a corporate program, I think of it from the strategic, which we've talked about, alignment, focus areas, company-wide culture, identifying your competencies. But then you have to start moving into the tactical. And that tactical is, is, okay, how do I execute this thing? You know, what are the tools that I need to get everybody engaged with? And one of the success areas, particularly with people who are new to, um, to AI machine learning and modeling, just predictive modeling in general, is the hub spoke concept. This is where the majority of the project management office and the majority of the project happens at the core in, in a core office. But portfolios of projects, small, small slivers of I need to have this data enhanced over here. I need this group to create, uh, create a new data feed so that we have this functionality working. I need to go over into to finance and, and, and have them give me their reports. I can't have it in Excel anymore. They need to be able to um, work with the CTO guys to actually get it put into, into the data warehouse so that the business people can, can, can use it. So the hub spoke structure works, works really well for mature or, uh, and, and for immature companies. And then as we mature, um, you can move some of those, those data, data scientists into the business. You can have small, mini, mini groups. I was working with a company who, um, for their, for their uh, in, in banking, for their predictive models for, for capital, they had a specific small team group who were um, doing uh, predictive modeling and machine learning, but the company was mature enough that it had the data sources available and that team did not have to rely on IT and, and data delivery to, to do their work. And then the other thing is, um, the other component is selecting a portfolio of initiatives. You know, um, company executives can't do a one and done kind of, uh, kind of paradigm for machine learning. They have to start experimenting you know, take their focus groups and say, hey, what can I do? What are some of the areas that, that I can experiment with? And these experiments should not be exotic. They shouldn't be, you know, high powered, high value, high risk um, opportunities. They should be mundane. The first, the first number, you know, AI and machine learning is meant for mundane work. It's not meant for the exotic stuff. It's, it's meant for items where we have a lot of data and we're, we're able to predict and train models with a high degree of certainty. And so selecting portfolios and working with the business leaders and the people on the floor to, to come up and say, hey, what is, what is the initiatives that we think that we can do? And get alignment on the budget, the resources, timing, and success metrics. And, that, and when I say alignment, I'm not saying senior executive alignment, I'm saying alignment with 
everyone, everyone in, in the company. Companies today are moving from this, this paradigm of, of hierarchical and, and compressing their, compressing their, their decision-making um, in, into uh, lower and lower uh, areas of, of the business. So in other words, um, the lay person, it has a lot more power to make decisions than they, they did 10 years ago. So they need, they are a stakeholder now. They're an important stakeholder. And so therefore they need to get um, to be on board with, with what they're being asked to do, their budgets, their resources and timing. Um, again, I'll give another analogy uh, or another story. I had um, uh, a team of people who were working on automation and um, they worked with a, a, a group a small unit where the unit was was um, really busy you know they did not have a lot of time and um, they were that team was being asked to put in a lot of time to go over process uh, process workflows and developing their process workflows they just didn't have time for that and and so they were bucking this whole automation, even though it was going to augment what they were doing and alleviate some of the pressure that they were that they were encountering. So, what we've done is we would take and, and include additional resources to help them sit with them, and we would do the workflows for them and come back and, and say, "Hey, does this look right? Does this look right? Does this look right?" and once we got that, then they were able to see what the benefit was to them. And, and then that was how we were able to get them bought in that automation was a good thing and, and, and get them on board with a, a, a digital and digital analytics mindset. So what skills are needed, how to change the culture, how to deliver, it really comes down to the journey begins with a great strategy and a plan. Um, leaders need to be thoughtful. This is this is just like any any corporate planning um, and strategy effort um, that 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 any corporation would have, regardless of whether it's AI or uh, and, and, and machine learning. But the point is, um, good strategy, good assessment, and um, realizing that that it is not just for product development. So here are the six questions. Uh, what is AI, ML? What should you, why should you care about it? Where's your company on the digital intensity spectrum? How will my people deliver AI and ML? Uh, what skills do my people need to deliver it? And how do I fit this into the culture? Um, and, and that's, that's, that's it. Um, for those folks, uh, if you're interested, uh, I have a survey, um, on the present, uh, about the presentation. Uh, if you, uh, want, you can fill it out and I appreciate it. I'll take questions now. Awesome. I love these six questions at the end because I, it, it's very easy to go through and see how a large company is going to answer this so much differently than say a, a smaller company, which has more agility, right? Um, like I, I, I insert my own company into that, right? Like if we look at work at daily and we think about where are we going to use AI? I mean, we're a, we're a full tech stack. We're not a tech company. We're a tech enabled company. Mm -hmm. So um, the companies that we outsource to in a sense are, we have to keep an eye on as you and I've talked about what kind of AI and ML they're using. And you know, how is that helping us? One place I do think a lot of people have brought up a possibility for us, and this is one I'd love to talk about with the whole team, is this concept of your initial conversations with the coach, since it's a, ch a chat situation, being done automatically, right? By a bot who's processing what you're typing in and asking for, and only escalating you to a human being when it realizes it can't answer your questions through the existing responses that have been set up right in that process and I know a lot of people are playing around with bots for that reason we have actively chosen to not go that direction 
because we think that people, there's too much of it going on, right? There's too, and, and we don't want people assuming a bot is responding to them. We want them to know a human's responding to them and that's what they're paying for. Mm -hmm. That being said, that's easy to say when you've got, you know, thousands of subscribers or even a hundred thousand. But if you, if you decided to scale this and go to a million, is that, is that possible? Is that when you're sitting there going, okay, we're big enough to implement something like this and, and have it done correctly. Does that make sense? Yeah. Yeah. And, and with, with that example, um, you have an overarching focus area. Your focus area is, is chatbots. Mm -hmm. um, and, and your, the area that you're, you know, when we talk about the strategy is you're, you're focused in on your product, which is, Hey, a customer, and your focus area is chatbot. And then within that, you have to ask yourself, okay, in what instances do I want to be able to have the chatbot do X or Y? Right. And, and one of the things that, that you have to also think about is data availability. Okay, so are you going to transfer all of that information to some other company to, to do that? And so the company is going to have to have these models trained on your particular um, flavor of chatbot. I'll give, you, I'll, give you this, I'll give you this thing. So I was working with, with um, optical character rec recognition. So you take, you take a document and you scan it into, into the system. Okay. And, that, and then the system is trying to figure out from that document whether it should go into this, into folder one, folder two, or folder three. Well, um, that, that computer ink isn't gonna just, just figure that out. It has to have many, many, many different versions of this paper in order to say, hey, it always goes into box, or into folder one. Sometimes it might go into folder two and someone's gonna have to come back and say, ah, it, it doesn't go back into folder two, it goes back into folder one. Mortgage servicing documents, your origination documents, when, you're, when, you're, when you've got a mortgage, all of that stuff gets scanned. And so the title goes into one folder your your loan your loan uh, your your loan agreement goes into another folder, but you have to train the computer to understand what a title is and understand what the, what what that the uh, the loan documents are. Same thing for your chatbot. You and and so the computer might see that and it, it it's great for your company for for wells fargo they have one format for for their for their origination documents they have one but for their title documents every single state has a different titles title thing and if they purchase purchase documents or purchase mortgages from chase or citibank they're on different different stuff so they have to train, they have to constantly train the, the AI and machine learning to figure out what documents are really a title. Same thing for you. You're in um, recruitment professional services. The documents and the chat bots and all that stuff that you have come in one flavor, but the flavor for, recruit, for recruiters is something totally different. Mm -hmm. So let me ask you a question. Mm -hmm. If only 8% of a thousand companies succeeded at implementing, one could argue that everyone's going to read that kind of data and go, well, I'm just going to wait till this stuff is more figured out. Mm -hmm. And I think that's a real concern because the vendors now have to figure out how to make adoption easier. Right? Do, yeah. I mean, would you agree? Do you think there's any historically, any industry or anything that we can look at that points to how this is going to progress and how they're going to make this process easier for adoption? Uh, you know, are we just going to wait and wake up one day? Because they're going to have to get more companies to adopt it in order to work the kinks out. It's, it's yeah. sort of like a catch-22. Um, but an 8% adoption rate, you know, success rate, ugh, you know. If, so, I'm, if I'm an executive, I'm like, yeah, no, uh, come back to me in a year. We'll, we'll stick right with what we got. 
So I think, um, I think we go back to what you were saying. It's a different paradigm for big companies versus mm -hmm. startups. Startups are extremely agile because if they're thoughtful about their data policy and, mm -hmm. and you know what they're what how they're thinking about data and being digitally, you know, having that digital mindset, you can capture data at the get go. You know, hey, I might not. You know, I might not need all these people's telephone numbers and addresses today, but I'm going to keep them all because a year from now, it's going to be gold. Um, so, so having that forethought from a smaller company um, is, 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 is good. Now, the, the downside for the smaller company is that they don't have the economies of scale around data that these big companies have. So, you know, you have to buy data or you have to, to find a vendor who is going to have already done all the, the legwork for you and you're just gonna purchase the, the module. For larger companies, the problem really is where are they in the digital intensity cycle? Okay. Are they mature? Um, uh, like financial services, or are they immature manufacturing, education to some degree? Mm -hmm. um, uh, I know um, at, at one company that I worked with, they had put um, a billion dollars, they, they allotted a billion dollars over five years to their data infrastructure because their commitment was we know what's coming down the pipeline. Our strategy, our 10 year strategy is dictating that we need to be able to understand our customers and we need to be able to make sure that the, the, the workflows that we're doing are, um, are, in control, meaning um, they're as tight and efficient as possible because we can't, we don't have, we don't have the leeway of having high costs. We're in a low margin business, which means every penny counts. That's what's drive, that's what's going to drive these people. When they see the competition actually lowering costs and, 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 and pulling out every little, little piece of, of, uh, of costs out of their, their structure. And then not only that, but starting to drive revenue, just like Work It Daily does with, with digital marketing and trying to build their customer base and, and their market share, um, uh, CRM implementation, automation, you know, that digital marketing component, that, that is going to start driving um, companies across the board. I, one last little piece mm. is that we in America, the, I, uh, there's, there's, a, there's a big drive in America for machine learning and automation. But when I had gone to, I had, I had traveled overseas and um, particularly in Africa, there's a huge opportunity for working on improving the, the workflow or the supply chain and then applying AI at the same time because those markets do not have, they have supply chains, but they're informal. And so they're formalizing their supply chains. They're adding the data layers on top of that supply chain and then applying on top of that um, the machine learning and the predictive modeling. So. I don't, I, it's not one of those things of, of uh, you know, adoption, hey, the other 92%, I'm not going to do anything. It's, okay, where do I spend my money and my resources to improve my profits and keep my product, uh, my, 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 my customers happy and keep, keep the competitors off my back? Right. So basically, 
you can wait, but you wait at the risk of your competitors figuring it out and driving down price faster than you can fix your cost structure. Yep. Yep. Totally makes sense. Fascinating. Um, all right. I don't want, I don't want to hog it all. Rob, Nina, do you guys have questions? Uh, yeah, I do actually, Todd. First of all, congratulations. Great job today. Thanks. Uh, thanks, for, thanks for jumping out there and, and being the first to put your stuff out there. And, and this is a great idea. I love this JT, by the way. It gives us a chance to actually go live and put a presentation on before we try it somewhere else. Uh, Todd, my specific question for you is you mentioned several times education as specifically the increased income potential for education. I'm very curious about that because I know through our learning management systems that we do bring in a ton of data on all of our students, our teachers, et cetera. Um, how do you see us being able to formulate that data, put it together, and actually use it to, especially for a private school, to maybe predict our future student body? Um, yeah. I, know, I know that right now in Montgomery, things are changing so much, the culture's changing, that we really don't have a good idea of exactly who we could expect in the next five years. Yep, yep. So it's, I, I, I tend to look at um, education in, in, in two, again, two or three components. If you're looking at it from quality, you know, student quality and the student product, you know, automation is how do I get the student through the system faster, smarter, you know, that kind of thing. Now, there's a whole entire analytics on that, you know, secondary, primary, secondary education, uh, elementary education uh, is going gangbusters with using, using AI to, to understand how kids and, and adults learn and customizing and tailoring the, the, the curricula to the, the individual. So it's literally the individualism of education. Love that stuff to death. I think that that, that in and of itself can um, make it so that it's, people are more efficient going through the process. Where I think, at, at least at the university level, there's an opportunity is really understanding the profit loss per student and collection of students, collections of departments, and how you can, can tailor the products to increase the revenue and reduce the cost. You know, um, I'm not 100% familiar with, with the educational systems budgeting process. However, you know, when I look at fees for students, like, uh, uh, I'm just going to use this one, and I, it's, it's a question, <laughs> a question, is that I'm doing an online course, but yet the university is charging me a university utilization fee for their facilities. I have to ask the question, why is it that I'm having to have the same price and I'm taking an online course than the actual student that's in, in a chair in the university? I know there's technology, I know there's all that other stuff, but there can be a differentiation. And having the university, having all of this data and being able to look to say, hey, how much does this program really cost? And how can I improve it so that I get the student through the course, no kidding, 100% of the time, on time, on budget, because hey, we know what the cost is per student to get through. Now, you also have to understand that from, from my perspective, the student is, is, is not a widget, which means that, hey, there's a cultural component there. But machine learning, AI, you take some of that that information and and use it to inform it, it, and that's that's what you're trying to do machine learning and 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 ai is a tool to achieve an objective so the university has to understand what are the objectives and i'm just using pnl as, as a component but using that as predictiveness of 
you know, how long is a student going to be in, in through through the through the course? How much are they going to spend at the university? What are they going to spend it on? And are they spending it in areas that are unexpected? So having that analytics to say, hey, our students are spending a heck of a lot over here, but we're not putting a lot of effort into X over here. And we're diverting a lot of the funds that should be going over here, over here. And, and fascinating. Yeah. So there's there's a whole dynamic that and and you can you can leverage business business principles to the university setting. But it's it's kind of a you know as well as I do, Rob, the bureaucracy and then the, the student culture the it, it is a major component they have to handle. Boy, that's true. I mean, the bureaucracy, you just hit it right on the head, especially when you talk about a public school as opposed to a private school. The, the, the whole dynamics are completely different. The funding is completely different. You were talking about budgeting. Um, the way the two look at budgeting is completely different. And yet I can see it through your presentation, the benefits of AI and ML. By the way, I love the clarification between artificial intelligence and machine learning. Uh, nobody knows that. You're right. Absolutely right. Um, but I can see clearly the benefits of this in education, even on uh, a small private school like us that has less than a thousand students. I mean, some of this data that we're collecting, I mean, it's a gold mine. I mean, yeah. we, we, could, we could figure out all kinds of things. And I think uh, I especially loved when you said, hey, we're putting this much money into this area. And yet, our teachers, or I mean, our students are actually coming over here to this area. Let's take some money out of here. Let's put it over here where it needs to go. Um, especially as we move forward and we're starting to integrate more and more online services, even at the private school level. Mm -hmm. so this is, this is a great thing. Thank you so much. The customer, the customer experience for universities. This was one of the things that when I was a, uh, a university student way back in the eighties, I was always wondering why it was that, um, the universities didn't look at, at me as a customer. They looked at my parents as the customer, even though I was paying, paying the bill. And, and, and what, what we're seeing more of today is that universities are, to a degree, looking at the student as the customer. And, and with all the data that you as a small school have, you can do a huge amount around yes media marketing and targeting of, of potential students or, or potential focus areas. And it all comes down to what is the, stra again, what is the strategy, the long-term strategy that the university has? Where do they think that they could put AI into it? And, and for universities, it could be that it's not a competitive advantage component. You, you might have a competitive advantage, but instead of new competitors, you, as being one of your major components, you might have something in there of, of um, relationship building, government government, uh, community relationship strategy, and how do I use AI in that government strategy paradigm to, to, boost, to boost my profit or, or the experience or, or any of those strategic areas that you're wanting to focus in on? Absolutely. Uh, yeah. it's, it's one of those things where the sky's the limit, huh? Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Thank well, you. With, that, with that in mind, I don't, I don't think there's any more questions, but I was thinking you might have some final thoughts that you want to share with us. Yep. Um, the, the thing is, it's only a tool. It's just a tool like Microsoft Office. Uh, you have to train on it just like you do with Microsoft Office. And Everyone, everyone in your office that uses Microsoft Office or Google Suite or Apple, whatever, they all get trained. So everyone, everyone needs to understand what it is. Um, I love it. This was really, really helpful. Thank you so much for doing this. Thank you. And for there were lots of shout outs and on how great the research was 
and how good the info was. So thank you for that. So we're going to process this and upload it. So if you're listening to this after the fact, you got the recording, please make sure that you go over and fill out Todd's survey. He would love feedback on the presentation which will also make sure we'll get the link in the follow-up to this. And if you are interested in doing a presentation next, all you need to do is message the executive coaching um, account and we will set you up for that. This is such a great way for everyone to get their thoughts out there, put one under their belt, you know, get feedback and certainly have a video recording so you can see how you did as well. So thank you, Todd. This was awesome. Thanks. I appreciate it. All right. Take care, everyone. We'll see you back here again soon. Have a great day. Thank you.